Okay, so just quickly, uh, Crown Bees, we've been around a while, about maybe uh, 12 years. Uh, we, um, company started in the garage and, and we focused mostly on uh, the Blue Orchard Mason Bee. And um, slowly but surely we're online and then we worked with nurseries and we, um, we understand a lot about uh, Mason Bees. We work with a lot of researchers. Uh, what was really important to us throughout this whole process is it's not just about selling bees and selling um, things for people to sell or you know, to buy. It's about helping you be successful. So we uh, care about what we sell. The quality of products is high. It has to work or we don't sell it. So that's kind of there. Um, boy, if you haven't visited our website, uh, we teach. We want you successful. So there's a lot of... Um, neat things in our, our website under learn we have faqs we um we have speakers programs we really want everyone to learn about native bees and then we collaborate we talk with our peers we talk with our competitors uh, uh this isn't about us this is about um making a difference in the world using um native uh, solitary bees so in today's presentation we're going to be talking about uh solitary bees. We'll talk a little bit about you know how this the whole bee kingdom works. We'll get uh, specifically into uh, the characteristics of this bee and then kind of how to's of you know what to be successful raising these bees. And uh, bottom line there's a there's a lot of information here. It is real simple. It's putting holes of the right size out there, having pollen in your yard, and placing bees out. There you go. I mean, it is that um, it's that easy. But we have, you know, we have some more things to chat about. So, um, surprisingly, uh, there are no honey-making bees in North America that are native. Uh, worldwide, there's there's a lot. 21, 24,000 species in North America. About 4,000 native bee species. Okay, that's a lot. None of them are honey-producing insects that's just the european um, but what's really important here is that when you're looking at the bee kingdoms um, a lot of bees nest in the ground maybe three quarters of bees nest in the ground and about a quarter nest in um holes cavities uh reeds and things so of those in that kingdom you know ground in, and in the holes about 10 percent are social bumblebee Honeybee, you can think of a hornet's nest, social where there's a queen and everyone working for the queen. Most of the bees, 90%, are solitary bees where every female is a queen. Okay, that's the rule, uh, not the exception. And when you actually look at how many, there's seven species of honeybees, that's not very many out of the 20 some thousand, so 0.003%. Honeybee is, um, is the most popular, there is no doubt. So uh, these bees, a solitary bee, each works alone. There's no communication. There's nothing to defend. As a leafcutter bee is out there, she's chosen her own hole. She's gathering a leaf bit. She's gathering the pollen. She doesn't have time to stop there and defend her hole. So she doesn't. Um, if you squish a leafcutter bee in your hand real tight, um, she does have a stinger. And so um, you'll... You'll get jabbed, but um, it's really hard to find where they stung you. And they're from all the researchers I've talked with, there is no case of anaphylactic shock from solitary bees. So a real gentle thing. Okay. Every female is a queen. And so she, she, she's doing everything. She's gathering the nectar and the pollen. She's building the nest. She's laying the eggs. The boys, eh, um, they made it and they're gone. So... <laughs> Not, you know, sorry to be male. And, and in this picture here, this is kind of cool. This is a female uh, leafcutter bee. She's on, a, um, this was in my backyard a while ago. This is a uh, squash plant. The eyes here are black. And if you look at this one here, these are just a beautiful greeny eye. Those are the males. And they're just real pretty. So um, when you get your bees and you're seeing, you know, females are black eyed. The males are this um, aqua. They're really, really beautiful. So um, that's the males. And uh, the other part that's kind of important to understand is that in a honeybee hive, a thousand eggs are laid a day, 
a thousand bees die a day. Okay, each bee, other than like the honeybee queen, maybe or the bumblebee queen, each bee lives about six weeks. So the eggs that the female has laid this year are next year's bees. And the other part that's kind of fun to understand is that through this, um, through the pollination period from you know spring all the way through deep summer. If there are flowers that natively show up in September or early March or February, then there had to have been bees that evolved with those flowers or else the flower couldn't have been there. Okay. So there are bees that show up, solitary bees, there's 90% of them out there, show up to match early spring, late spring, early summer, midsummer, deep summer. So every bee has their part of the year where they've evolved and the eggs they lay goes through some life cycle that has them back out there the following year at the right time. Okay, so here's this question mark. This says Damaris. <laughs> what am I saying? Or what are we hearing? Um, hi. Um, we've got a couple of questions, but I think they'll be answered um, in the upcoming slides. So I think we can just keep going. Great. Okay, so the kind of next important to us is understanding pollination. It's it's uh, very different than what a lot of people understand. And so we all know the honeybee, super organized. Uh, they've got a thing called a waggle dance. Okay, let me let me back up. Out of the thirty or forty thousand bees in a hive, um, it's super important that with those thousand eggs laid a day. Boy, a thousand mounds of pollen are needed a day. And so they've evolved to be really organized. There's a waggle dance. Some little bee goes at an angle, uh, matches the sun declination. The length of the dance says how far to fly. And so the bees will go out there, a honeybee will go out there and, and find that one tree. She's going to gather all the pollen from that tree, go back to the hive, and then go back to that tree again until all the pollen is pulled from that source. And then she'll come back and then look for other dances. So they are amazing, long distance, single source, they're getting every grain of pollen. Okay, your solitary bees, leaf cutters, mason bees, um, not so sophisticated, um, not, not really, no, no communication. So they, um, they meander, they're looking for pollen in a tight little radius. The solitary bees typically are 100 meters, 300 feet, and they know where their house is, so they're going to meander around and gather all the pollen they can. But because of how they're gathering this pollen, uh, it's being spread. And we'll talk a little bit more. A little, it's kind of important here. The honeybee, because they need so much pollen during the day, they're keeping it sticky on their hind legs. When I spoke with Dr. Musson, uh, UC Davis, years ago, he said, Dave, this pollen back there, that's not pollen. That's bee food. The pollen is rarely being held on the body. It's they're so efficient. Okay, so these guys, the honeybee is an amazing pollen carrier. Now I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. This is how the bees evolved. Okay, your solitary bees, super inefficient. They're belly flopping onto a flower, cramming their hairy body everywhere they can to get that pollen to stick into their hairs. Next flower, dry pollen belly flopping that flower again, and the pollen's just spreading everywhere. So the solitary bees typically are wonderful pollen spreaders. And again, they're moving in a meandering you know, area. So pollen is moving from well, dandelion to other dandelions. You know, they're, they're, they're quite amazing. Okay, this is important. Okay, and and I, I say this, you know, so if you have a question here, this is why um, when we're working with the leafcutter bee in uh, acorn squash fields, farmers complained about having too much acorn squash. They couldn't pick it fast enough. They weren't used to this type of pollination. We've had uh, triple the yields in uh, sweet potatoes. We've had farmers complain that by the time they got back to the beginning of the bean row, uh, the beans were dried on the vine. They couldn't pick them fast enough. Farmers aren't used to using bees that are spreading the pollen. Damaris? Hi, sorry. Um, we don't have any uh, current questions for this section, so we can just okay. keep going. 
Good. All right. So, <laughs> hey, you people listening, okay, I hope you got it done. They're, they are amazing pollen spreaders. Okay. And again, um, I am not being, I'm trying not to be disrespectful. The honeybee uh, is an amazing insect and it's, you know, the background of everything we do nowadays. It's just that the learning curve is changing now. There's something new on the block and we're, you guys are part of that change. So let's talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the leafcutter bee. It is, uh, another word is the alfalfa leafcutter bee. Uh, scientifically, it's Megacali rotundata. It's a solitary bee, does everything in summer. It's a generalist. So it's not only getting alfalfa, it's getting onion seed. It's you know spreading pollen from dandelions. They're just amazing cross pollinators. They're a little, um, when you see them, they're, they're a lighter color. Uh, just an overview, uh, overwintering as a larva. The warmth makes them shift into adults. Uh, they use leaf bits. That picture here is real telltale. They use leaf bits rather than like a mason bee uses mud. There are other bees that, um, as they're nesting, some bees will use resin. Some bees use cactus pulp. This bee, as she is nesting, uses leaf bits to separate her pollen and egg chambers. So just kind of um, an understanding of uh, the alfalfa leafcutter bee. Back in the 40s, uh, you know, 1940s, um, as the alfalfa industry was doing whatever they're doing, they needed to get seed, and they'd bring honeybee hives out there. And when this flower trips, uh, springs open, it smacks the bee right on the head, just bonk. And the, and the honeybees don't like that, okay? So um, they weren't great pollinators, but it's the only pollinators we had back then. So um, I spoke with the son, Wendell, I remember his last name. I spoke with the son of this guy, and this is back in the 40s. And his son, is he's like a nine-year-old kid, and he's sitting on a fence. And the dad brings from Europe a tube full of leafcutter bees. And he said to his son, he goes, watch, son, here goes money. And he, and he and the bees, off they went. And he said, they just kept on going. That was about it. <laughs> so, you know, Next year, he said, sit down the fence. And the dad got some more bees from Europe. And he says, okay, son, here goes money. And... Uh, and the bees came back and nested. And so you move forward and uh, then all of a sudden there became, they realized this bee doesn't mind getting smacked on the head with, with the uh, pistol from the flower. And uh, it's become a huge, you know, huge industry where all of that alfalfa is moved into, you know, fed livestock, et cetera. And so uh, it did, it changed the course of that whole industry. And, um, well, uh, a few years ago, uh, one of my peers is, is an alfalfa farmer or bee farmer. I said, so what happens if you put that bee in a garden? He goes, I don't know. It only does, pol you know, only does alfalfa. I said, so what if you put it in a garden? He goes, well, I don't know. Try it. Okay. And so, the, <laughs> hey, what happens when we put it on, you know, other things, sweet potatoes? I, goes, I don't know. No one's ever done it. So we're, Carnival Bees is kind of innovators. We put them on a lot of different things and surprisingly it's a good bee so um these bees uh they live in houses you know we call it a bee house not a hive hives are for honeybees they nest in holes so they're an opportunist if there's a hole uh they're not going to make one like a carpenter bee they're going to go into and use a pre-made hole uh these bees are smaller bees so they're going into a six millimeter hole as they're choosing a hole to nest in each bee chooses her own little hole and it's her she actually she puts a pheromone down there and so as they go in and out they know which you know which hole is theirs and it's easy really leaf bits in the yard pollen and holes and it really is kind of that tough you know not that tough so inside those holes uh the the bees are trying to protect their eggs so they've uh, they've gathered leaf little bits. They're flying, and we'll show a picture of these bees flying in, in a couple seconds. But they fly with a little bit of leaf. They curl it up inside these holes. Uh, they're gluing these leaf bits together with their saliva. Now they bring in the pollen and nectar, and they lay a little egg. And then she chews up a little bit of leaf bits and seals that with a, with a vertical wall. She seals that last little chamber and then works her way out. So in a six-inch long hole, maybe, I don't know, 15? 
hour or so, eggs have been laid. She starts from the back, works her way all to the front. And the last little part, oh, I've counted. She has like a whole bunch of discs of flowers and or, or of leaf bits. And I've counted maybe like 60, 65 individual trips just to see all that little chamber. So it's kind of cool. That's roughly what goes on inside the holes. And before we jump into the how-tos, this is this is uh, an overview of what is this bee. Damaris? Okay, so Actually, we have a couple of questions. One is if the leaf cutters are native or not native to the U.S. Um, it, the leaf cutter bees that we predominantly sell are non-native. They are naturalized. Um, and when we, 98% um, maybe, 2% are um, an Osmia um, pugnata is, uh, they, both bees get in there and so you'll, we, we find both in there. Uh, but the industry itself that we walked into with the leaf cutters is the European. And we had a debate about this a while ago, uh, native versus um, naturalized. And Crown Bees as a food company, kind of masquerading as a bee company, and so just like I don't want to remove the tomatoes or cherries or apples from my yard because they're not native, if I've got a pollinator and I'm hungry, I'm going to use them. Any other questions, Maris? Um, um, actually, well, we have some Dave, questions before about... we continue, um, if I could get you to, if you look on the top of your screen, there's a little alert from Google. I couldn't take that thing off. Okay, no worries. Oh, uh, wait, hide notification. I certainly can. All right, thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> so we do have, so do, we have um, a lot of questions popping up. Um, some of these will be answered later. We have a lot of questions about nesting materials. Do you want to wait to answer those? Uh, it'll be on the next, <laughs> next couple of minutes. Okay. So jump ahead. Um, let's see. Where we're getting a lot of questions. Oh, I did want to bring up something. Um, I wanted to let everyone know um, we unfortunately don't have a lot of time to answer your questions about mason bees. And this presentation is about leaf cutter bees. So we're going to focus on leaf cutter bees today, which are active in the summer. So I just wanted to let everybody know that we'll be answering questions about how to raise leaf cutter bees in this webinar. And our website has a ton of information about how to raise mason bees. And a lot of your questions about um, mason bee behavior and how to raise them are on our website. So let's move forward. And Carl, we've also got the webinars from our mason bees uh, stored on YouTube. Uh, that that's correct. It's on YouTube, and they're also listed on our website and our blog. Cool. Okay. So um, understanding life cycles. Okay. So early summer. So these guys, let's just say, over the winter, it's a larva inside a little leafy cocoon. So um, May, June, depends upon where, where you're at. Uh, the bees are going to. Um, develop from larva to adult bee quickly. Um, uh, they're going to merge. The boys come out first. And then they're going to mate, waiting for the girls. And then they're mating. Uh, the boys are gone. The females are building their nests and they're pollinating and, and um, they're done within six weeks. And then those uh, eggs that they laid are in that pollen are going to hatch. The larva or the you know egg hatch becomes a tiny little larva and then it consumes all the pollen that was left there for and pollen and, and nectar and then uh, changed to be a larva and it just sits there uh, waiting for next spring. Um, sometimes in hot temperatures, um, good like the southeast, you might find that um, for some reason some of the bees, uh, some of the larvas uh, shift, hey it's warm enough and you get a whole complete, uh, you might have two cycles in the summer so you might get a good 12 weeks of pollination. Um, yeah, it happens. So it's it's a kind of neat little thing. Uh, different way of looking at it. Uh, you would, if you were doing this yourself, you're thinking a few weeks before when you want these bees to emerge. So you're going to incubate. We'll talk about that in a second. When you want the bees out, you're releasing them. Okay. 
that we're looking for warmer temperatures, 24 Celsius, 75. Um, when, when the food that you want pollinated is there, you know, uh, you're going to wait and watch. They're actually really kind of fun. They're um, slightly timid. If you're raising mason bees, you can walk up pretty close and nothing happens. If you raise leafcutter bees, they'll see you and they'll kind of back in. They're a tinier bee. I guess they don't want to get squished, but they are fun to watch. Um, late summer, you're taking them out and kind of protecting them. We'll show you a little bit. In the winter time, you're just storing these uh, in a garage or a shed and then kind of starting the cycle again. You, you're opening holes up. And we'll talk about this later in the uh, spring, early summer. Okay, installing a house. Super easy, similar to mason bees. The house is you're trying to catch morning sun. If you're in hot country, we think you might not want to, um, if this is sitting in, this, in 100 degrees all day long, you're going to make an oven out of it. So maybe some afternoon shade would be good if you're kind of um, sitting there in the high temperatures. Head height, if you're short, put it short. If you're tall, put it tall, just so that you could see what's going on. Okay, the holes are just kind of facing out. And again, we're, we're doing this, you're putting this house out there with the right temperatures and, and with the food you want um, there in front of you. Okay, any, I think this is simple, but any house related questions? Yeah, so we have questions about how many nesting holes you wanna provide for each cocoon. Like how many should you plan to provide for each cocoon? That's that's a good that's a good question. Um, we found with this uh, bee, it disperses somewhat. So uh, we're if we're giving you uh, an order, we roughly giving you two hundred cocoons. We know in there maybe eighty of those are female, and each female might do two holes. We also know this bee disperses. So maybe out of those eighty, maybe thirty or forty might hang around. So in general, if you've got a you know, couple hundred leafcutter cocoons, roughly 40 or so holes would be about right. Okay, so well, we have a lot of questions about reusing the bee house. And you can reuse the bee house. You remove your mason bee, the eight millimeter size nesting holes, and then place out six millimeter size nesting holes for the leafcutter bees because these are a smaller bee. You're right. Uh, and then we have a lot of questions about um, warm weather. If you live in a place that gets warmer than like 100 degrees, is it better to put the house into shade instead of facing south? Hey, great question. Uh, so my dad lives in Palms Desert where it gets really hot and he has the bees underneath in a shaded area and uh, they're nesting there all the time. So I think maybe not direct sun and it, it just faces his house. I don't know which direction it's facing. So I think the, I'm going to make this up on the spot, Damaris. I think if it's super hot where you're at, um, shaded fine, it shaded all the time would be fine. Okay. One more question real quick. Can you put your um, leafcutter bee house in a greenhouse? Oh, wonderful question. Um, we have learned, okay, it depends upon the size of your greenhouse. As we work with researchers, completely netted, the bees are stuck in there doing whatever they're doing in netted environments. In a uh, greenhouse, smaller greenhouses, um, the bees just want them, they, they want more room. Okay, so I'm going to say if you can lock them in there and they can't get out, they're stuck. Um, greenhouses that have a, um, where the UV can actually get through the ceiling, um, or the roof, then the bees should nest in there if you can stop them. Um, i working with larger nurseries or places that are actually doing with greenhouses. They've got uh, uh, alcoves where the bees can't get out and there's... You've got the vents that are kind of netted off with um, a, a screen netting. So they they keep the bees inside there. That's a wonderful question. If you have doors that just open and close, um, I would have the bee house on the outside of the door 
and leave the door to the greenhouse open. The bees don't mind going in there and finding pollen. Every bee needs about a square yard of pollen a day. So if the greenhouse door is open, they can meander in there, find their pollen, and meander back out. Um, I don't think they it's it's an issue in that aspect. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Dave. We can move on to the next um, slide. Holes. Uh, so nesting holes. Uh, we have found that uh, the more natural, the better. Okay. So whether you're using uh, reeds or paper tubes or uh, wood trays, um, we find that the pollen loaf needs to breathe. A lot of times uh, things, uh, bees get moldy in there. So nature has no plastic in it. Um, we do want you to consider harvesting cocoons in the fall. And so if you have um, bamboo or drilled blocks, uh, they're hard to move from. So uh, anything that's natural, the leaf cutter bees are smaller bees, so six millimeters in, in diameter and five to six inches long, okay? If the holes are too big, the bees typically, may, or the leaf cutter bee won't use them. Um, if they're too short, you wind up with mostly males. So I, we do ask that you try to avoid bamboo. Um, and we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about pests in a bit that do accumulate inside there. Uh, so drilled blocks of wood and bamboo, um, not so, not so good. Super cheap, we get it, just not as good for the bees. Okay, I think it's simple. <laughs> and if you have stuff from from big box stores that are all made out of bamboo, um, you know, you've got it. Uh, try using it, and see what happens. Just realize that um, there's going to be a lot of pest to build up inside there. Okay, so we had a question about um, if you reuse the nesting hole. So maybe if you could explain the difference between our reeds, the bee tubes, and our nesting trays, I think that would be good. Um, so what happens when a bee goes into a nesting hole? She's she's going back into the back end, laying the you know pollen and the eggs and sealant chambers. As she's doing this, she's also bringing in pests, okay? And so in this hole are a whole bunch of pests that have accumulated with her. Uh, it's natural. It's just what, you know, it's what happens in nature. But if you do nothing, the pests are still in there the following year when the leafcutter bees are trying to reuse these holes. And a lot of the energy just goes back towards feeding the pests. And there is fungus out there. There's some things out there. So we're always saying open the holes up reeds these are not bamboo this is a lake bed reed that we get out of like utah for example you just crack the ends with your fingers and then they split in half uh, our paper tubes um unwind you can snip it in with a pair of scissors and they just kind of unwind in a spiral or these are wood trays that each tray this is uh seven trays or you can open them up and now you've got access to all of these leaf cutter cocoons Jump. Um, yes, we can move on. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, the last important part. Um, this is a um, this video that Carl was taking of the leaf cutters in action. They use leaf bits. Okay, uh, you'll see that they can curl it. There's not too many veins in them. It's not. Um, it's not a from a squash plant where it's too thick and too fuzzy. Uh, so these plants that they use, um, we know rose leaves, rose petals, hosta, lilac, sometimes dandelion. It's anything that they can cut easily. Like a blueberry leaf is too thick to cut. Okay, so they're, they're, they're wonderful. The only, I was nervous about these in my yards years ago and I'm out here in the Northwest and I've got a lot of green things in my yard. I've had thousands of these bees flying in my yard and I can't find where the holes are being pulled from. I looked at my roses. I finally found one like a couple years ago on some little host on the ground. So uh, very, uh, very important that if you're out there doing a crop that has only thick leaves, that you actually provide a sacrificial leaf that be with them.
Okay, that was really important. Um, so, how do we get started? Uh, these are summer pollinators again. Okay, um, to us, these are workhorses. Okay, they're there. We really want them pollinating your yards, pollinating your farms. Okay, so you would be thinking ahead when do I want to pollinate X, my beans, my squash, my cucumbers, or whatever. So if you're going to purchase the bees from us, you know, make sure you have the holes in the house and everything. Um, pick a bee ship date. So we mail everything out on Mondays, and sometimes, well, even today, it's, it's tough getting the post office out. We, we send it's free shipping. We put everything in the first class little mail pouches, and it takes uh, five to you know five to six days to get from Washington to Florida. Um, but the bees are there. It takes about a week, so there they are. If you have cocoons yourself and you want to um, uh, have them, you know, schedule them for when you're trying to use them, um, you've got to plan ahead a little bit. Okay, so as you're planning ahead, uh, you've taken your cocoons, you've moved them to some place that's dark. Okay, when we're incubating the bees for you guys, it takes us about three weeks at exactly 84 degrees. So we know this, and at three weeks, Bam, at like clockwork, every single week we have thousands of bees being incubated. If you're doing this yourself, um, you've got it maybe in a utility space. It might take five weeks, you know, at 75 or something like that. Anything above 60 has the bees, has the larva shifting from larva to bee. About halfway through, there's this uh, tiny little wasp. It's called Terramalis. Um they, they're really good at putting other wasps in developing bees. So if you see them about halfway through, you've put these into a, a bee guard bag, you know, a fine mesh that you can see into. Um, you'll see these little black little black um, mat, gnats in there. Squish them. If you don't squish them, they're gonna, they really move through there. So this happens about halfway through. Okay. When the first male bee emerges, you'll see them. They're beautiful little green eyes. Okay. Um, wait a few more days. These guys have... Um, they finish their development. Their fuel tanks in their abdomens are full. They can wait a day. Uh, they can wait a day. They can wait. We've had them in our chambers for two weeks, and they're still just waiting to go out. So, I'll wait a few days, and then when you're ready, uh, take everything and put them into your houses. Okay, super easy to do. Um, if we shipped the bees to you. Uh, you've got a bag full of squiggly bees, okay? They're, they will, we didn't ship, they weren't all the way out when we started. There are a lot we have come out during the mail. Um, uh, be careful, there's squiggly bees in there. Our instructions say, hey, put them in the fridge for 15 minutes. I'm not going to kill them, just, just no more than half an hour. They're going to cool down. You're not going to be able to take them out, put them into a house attic, push the bag back as far as you want to go open it up don't you know make sure the bag is facing out oh my gosh these bees are not that smart um if you turn it sideways they just look at you and die okay so just make sure the bag's open facing out and um if you've got a cocoon hatchery here's how we're putting them out into our um chalets if you have other stuff here's a little cocoon hatchery there's these are super cheap three or four dollars just has a hole in the end you're tossing your cocoons in there and you're able to just kind of keep them away from birds pecking at things it takes a little while the bees aren't all emerged but they will they will mostly emerge if it's super hot out where you're at in the 90s um be a little different go kind of uh, take the take all of the cocoons and bring them into the house in someplace dark. And every day go out and just let them out as they emerge. We've learned that when it's 90 and 100 degrees, the bees inside the cocoons can't regulate themselves. And they just perish, you know, die in the cocoon. So if it's super hot, just bring them inside and then bring them out as they emerge. Daily type thing. Okay? Not a big deal. Okay. Surely there's got to be questions, Damaris. Yeah, um, there are a lot of questions, and I think that we lost the slide that I created to answer this question mm -hmm. about timing. Like, can you raise mason bees and leafcutter bees at the same time? Um, Which I yes. think is complicated. 
it is complicated. Um, hmm. So yeah, to do them both can. at the same time. Sorry. Yeah, to do both at the same time. So um, mason bee uses bigger leaf cutters. You know, use smaller. Uh, a mason bee will use a small hole. Leaf cutters typically don't use big ones. But the the hard part is that um, they don't recognize each other's species. And so if a mason bee has chosen this one hole, she's laid her scent into it, a leaf carrier bee is going to go in there and start putting leaf bits into it because it's just kind of the thing to do. And so you, um, or you'll get mud in a leaf cutter chamber. And if there's two bees trying to use the same thing, ah, the big bee kind of wins. No one's dying, but they're pushing things around. So we think it's easier to finish with the mason bees. You've taken out the big holes that where there are, you're protecting those. And you're then putting in to the same house the smaller holes for the leaf cutter bees. Marissa, how would yeah. you temper that? Yeah, I I think what you should do is around six to eight weeks after your mason bees have arrived, that's when the mason bees should be done. That's when you can order your leaf cutter bees. Um, I also really want to point out that um, it's a good idea for you to get to really know your local weather patterns because the leafcutter bees need a warm, consistent temperature. In some places, especially in the northern climates, that doesn't happen until around June. So for some of our customers, it might be a good idea to, to wait a couple of weeks before you order your leafcutter bees. And especially if you've got mason bees flying right now, I think it's a lot easier to raise, raise them separately from each other and um, just wait a couple more weeks for your mason bees to be done nesting. So I hope that helps with, um, we've got a lot of questions about that. Um, yes. We also have a lot of questions about putting the leaf cutter bee cocoons into the fridge over the winter. If you could um, talk okay, about so, that first. Um, wow, gosh, you had one thing I was going to comment on. Um, about lost. raising mason bees and leaf cutter no, bees? No, it had to do with leaf, okay, anyway, I lost it. The weather? Um, <laughs> yes, 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 okay. yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, nighttime okay. temperatures don't matter. If it's 50s at night, it, they're bugs. Uh, in, in all cases, they're bugs. And bugs are, they just, their blood slows on down. So it, it can be 40 at night and high 70s in the day and the bees are doing just fine. Okay. What was your other question, yeah. Maris? Oh, okay. Um, now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, about, uh, can you talk about putting leaf cutter bee cocoons in the fridge over the winter? Um we we put our cocoons in a cooler um and there's not a lot of moisture inside there and we're not concerned about um the leafy bits getting moldy when we put them into refrigerator um we found that in our in our humidities with the mason bees we just found that the leaf uh pieces just get moldy and and everything kind of falls apart and dies so we've we've said as long as the temperatures are below 60, so 30 minus five is fine. For the winter time, uh, keep them in a cold garage under your house, just someplace cool, because the, the larvae are just in uh, hibernation and no big deal. Okay, so now, now we're getting a lot of questions about being able to store leaf cutter bees after they've arrived in your fridge to keep them cold. And so, yeah, yeah. So you wrote the instructions. What are you going to say to Mars? I'm going to say no. They um they <laughs> arrive ready to start flying. You want to pick your ship date to be when your flowers are are open and you're ready to start raising the leaf cutter bees. They can't be stored in the fridge. They can't be fed on a um, fake nectar source. You know, everything needs to be ready for them as soon as the bees arrive. So make sure that you pick a good ship date for your leaf cutter bees. They can probably hang in the refrigerator for an hour or so. Um, it's just, they're not designed. If, if you, you could probably take all the live bees and put them in the fridge for, you know, a little while, but it's the bees are mid development. If you take them out of that mid development, you kill them. And so that's where cooling the bees as they're almost baked, you know, almost done, you mm -hmm. killed those bees. That's why we can't cool them once they've started. Okay. Okay. Next one. Okay. Next I think one. we can move on. Um, yeah. Okay. And then really, here's the fun part. Um, watch them go. 
Uh, and, they, and, you know, this is a teammate of ours, Jay Williams, out of uh, Tennessee. This is out of his yard. So it's like, yeah, man, what are they, greens and purples and pinks? And, you know, it could be roses, could be flowers, could be whatever. They just go to town. Um, again, you may see, you know, a second generation. I even heard people getting thirds, you know. Um, you'll notice that something's happening because there'll be a hole in the end, just like that. So someone chewed through. So here's a second generation started. You can see another one here. Okay, now also realize that there are other um, guests that find the holes in your houses. Okay, so there are grass using uh, wasps typically and other wasps that are using um, mud bits and they're bringing in um, there's hard-sided critters, so they're bringing in crickets and stuff, uh, lace wings. There's a uh, wasp that'll focus on soft-sided things, and uh, they're wonderful. You know, in the in your yard, it truly is eat or get eaten. And um, we're we're saying, why wouldn't you want to have um, predator and prey in your yard? If you have really small holes, uh, there are uh, aphid. Uh, wasps that'll take the aphids off your flowers and stuff them in. So um, be aware, you might get something kind of scary looking using these holes, and it's natural. Okay, uh, when you open things up, uh, Demers put this together. There's a whole bunch of little different cocoons. This looks like a little bullet. We, I think this one matches this one. There's grass things. There's just here's a leaf cutter. They're just this was the Mason bee cocoon. There's just some really weird things out there. Um, there will be more than just your leaf cutter bees. On this specifically, any questions at all there? Yeah, um, we just had a good question about if the bee house should be completely filled with nesting holes or should they leave space? Hmm. Um, should we worry about birds being attracted to the bee house? So good good questions, let's hold that. Um, Let's change our slide deck on that one, Numerus. That's a good call. Um, so with your um, nesting holes, with a with a big empty space there, it's so attractive for um, bird nesting or even getting some uh, paper wasps and stuff inside there. We recommend either just filling the upper cavities, the empty spaces with uh, balled up paper or sticks or, or big rocks or something would be um, one way to uh, detract that. What was the other question, Demers? Um, let's see. Oh, um, a two is there question. a way to, to keep birds out of your oh, bee house? Yes. Um, yes. So the, we've got a, uh, we have a, we've learned that, um, birds will go in after tasty little larva and whatever. So, uh, we have, if you go to our website under accessories, you'll find, uh, we call them bird guards and it's, uh, we've learned that about a three quarter inch hole size is best and we just have a little something that fits across a variety of our houses that um, half inch winds up being a little too small and one inch is a little too easy for birds to get their heads through so about a three quarter inch screen um, in front so you'll find bird guards is um, it's, a, it's a great i've it's a great question i have lost uh, some of my bees to my birds in my yard Okay, so then um, we, I did just want to quickly point out for the, the summertime guests that are also attracted to the house since you leave the nesting materials out all summer, that um, what you'll see is different capped end materials. So some of this will be mud, some of it will be grass sticking out, some of it could be resin or wool carter bee, and that will help you... Um, figure out who's come along and used your bee house. And that's that's a really fun part about watching the leafcutter bees over the summer. Yeah, your yard's just not filled with only one plant. You know, your yard's not only filled with one. one. So um, on that same thing, if you have found that here is a grass using something, um, take those out after, after kind of filled um, if you can gently take them out and, and segregate them, this allows you to release them the following year at different uh, times. So if you were aware of what's going on in here, it might help you manage your bees a little bit. Fair? Yeah, and yeah, and I'd just like to let everyone know that our website does cover 
how to manage your wild bees under the wild bee hotel section. So some of the questions in here about um, interesting different bees and wasps that come to nest, um, the steps for what to do with them are on our website. Um, and there, it's pretty similar to raising the leafcutter bees, but you'll find your answers there. Thanks. Okay, so we find that your um, leafcutter bees are done, and um, that birds will go after these things. Other things will go after your bees. So we just—it's a simple piece. If you want to protect your bees from getting eaten, um, we pull them out and put them into a, a bee guard bag, is is what we call this. And we're going to move this away from the outside into some place cooler. Okay, if you bring them inside the house, um, just be aware, watch it occasionally. You might find a second generation. Some, some things just show up all of a sudden. Um, so know where you did this, um, but do watch it occasionally. Uh, we've had people that didn't harvest and they thought the leaf gutter bees had come out. And then, yeah, they did. But uh, a different bee came out a month later and just came out in the bag and just died. It's like, ee, you know, um, so remove and protect. And uh, what you're, what we're trying to do is just keep, uh, well, normal temperatures. But if you're trying, okay, I, I said that um, for the winter time, you're going to be keeping your bees someplace cooler. So not um, if you're down in the desert. I don't know. You're just trying to keep things cool. Okay. So why harvesting? So when you're harvesting, you are, this is again the spring, you're doing a couple different things. This is this tiny, this is a, a big example of that tiny little wasp. It's really small, okay? It loves to, um, how it works itself in a life, it walks on down between all the leaf bits and then lays its ovipositor through the side and impregnates, you know, throws its eggs into the waiting larva inside there. And so it'll walk on down the entire length, just putting little eggs into every single one. And then if it's the right time during the summer, those 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 little, you know, larva from the wasp become adult wasps real quick like, and then they scurry on down and just start laying eggs everywhere and easily run through things. So if you don't manage this one insect, you'll lose a lot of your bees. So there's one. Okay, the other part, um, back 15 years ago, um, the entire leaf cutter bee industry only used drilled blocks of wood. And so everywhere, North America, I mean, so Canada and, and US, everything's drilled blocks of wood. And um, it, what they didn't realize is that there is a spore, chalk brood, very similar to the mason bee spore called chalk brood, but that only impacted the leaf cutter bees. And so within three to five years, the entire industry closed down because there were no bees anywhere. It was just solid chalk brood. And so the only uh, province in all North America that was clean was Saskatchewan. And so we know chalk brood is in every state and in every province except for Saskatchewan. And so uh, those are the only bees that we source because we don't want to be spreading chalk brood, but that's one of the main reasons why you harvest. Um, it does allow you to know how many cocoons you've got, roughly. You know, these be long cigars. You, know, you can break them into little segments and it gives you a feel. Um, and then also you'll be able to find any little wild cocoons, those, you know, those fun things over there. You can figure out which one, you know, put them in different containers. And um, we've actually done this where you take a whole bunch of these little um, bullet-shaped things and put them into a little Tupperware or something, keep them warm. And uh, all of a sudden, I don't know, scary looking wasps show up. But, um, yeah, you know, <laughs> and then you go let them out to go do their thing. But um, keeping them separate sometimes helps. And then it does allow you to prepare for incubation. Questions here? So um, how do you clean the reusable wood trays um, so that you can use them again after harvesting? Uh, that, yes. Un unlike mason bees, that get it gets pretty muddy. When we use leafcutter bees, there's a little bit of um, glue that the um, leafcutter bee use, kind of salivy, so it gets, you'll see things kind of stick in there. Um, but if you're using like trays, 
uh, our cocoon comb really is all you need. Push it out. If you are pushing cocoons out and you see them break apart and there's a chalky dust, poof, that's chalk brood. And then you're going to shift into, um, we would spot treat that with our clean bee, um, kills chalk brood. I would be careful. I mean, it's, you'll only really see this when you are harvesting uh, the cocoons. Questions, other ones, Tamaris? Um, about harvesting, I don't I don't believe so. We do have a lot of questions. It's a little hard to keep up with reading everyone's <laughs> questions, but we're trying our best. I also we wanna do. let people know that I, I will reply to you if we don't get a chance to answer here. And we, we are getting pretty close to the end. There you go. We are, yes, <laughs> we got the, yes, I, I, yeah. Um, so this was a lot of information. You know, you can go catch the slide again, or we have a thing called B-mail. Um, Damaris and Carl write it, and it's it's uh, it's once a month we say, hey, do this in the fall, do that. So it covers both mason bees and leafcutter bees, and it's it's our way of helping you guys be successful. So if you haven't done this yet, at the bottom of any one of our web pages is just a little square down there. Just type in your email and and we're real careful. This just keeps with us. We don't do anything. We don't believe in selling things. So it's just for us to tell you what to do. Um, other than that, um, if you haven't seen our website, it is, um, well, just a second. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna cheat and here is, if you haven't seen our, um, uh, if you haven't seen our website, we've got the um, the learn tab up here has uh, learning all about mason bees, leaf cutter bees, etc. So learn is uh, your best source of just I want to learn about raising leaf cutter bees. Uh, you can buy anything here. Here's you know kits with bees, etc. Uh, we've got some various programs, uh, talking and teaching. And then um, if you've got questions, boy, we've, we've tried to get them answered. Um, if you need to talk with us, we've got little parts up here. Uh, so we, we care. We try to answer. Um, uh, we try to answer. We've got YouTube videos. There's a Crombie's channel out there. Um, Damaris is our uh, Facebook guru, Instagram. Um, We've got books uh, that we've written. So we, we care. We honestly, we want you successful. Uh, that's it, I think. Uh, what other questions that, you know, who's dying? <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't, we had, we had a couple of questions early on about why you would raise the leafcutter bees. Like, do you have to grow vegetables or, or food to oh. raise the leafcutter mm -hmm. bees? And what's your answer? I, if you have lots of flowers and you have um, plants with the right kind of leaves and you want to raise the bees for fun, then please do it. <laughs> They're a lot of fun. They are a lot of fun. Yeah, so they will gather pollen from anything. Okay. Any other ones out there? Hey, hey Dave, actually, I had one that we didn't yeah. get to earlier. Sure. Um, uh, it was a question about the length of the nest materials and how that affects the ratio of males to females. So yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. In a nesting hole, let's just call it six inches long, um, the female lays, uh, the, the queen, she's laying eggs at the back end of the hole and she's fertilizing these eggs. So these eggs will all be females at the end of the hole. And then the unfertilized eggs at the end of the hole are all males. Okay, so she knows that as birds can peck in or something, she knows to keep the, the females all protected. So typically in a six inch hole, eh, like, you know, 40% of the way through is all females. So if you shorten this hole from six inches down to like three inches, realize that you've now got just a few little females and then mostly males. So we have found with the mason bees, clearly six inches is fine. With the leaf cutter, eh, five to six inches is fine. Thanks, Carl. Demers, any other ones out there? Um, um, no, I think I will do my best to answer everyone's questions. Um, you, you should be getting an email from me 
Um, I take a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it probably will take a while. There's a lot of questions here. And I really um, encourage everyone to check out our website because the learn section should cover a lot of these questions and um, questions about our products. You should be able to find answers for pricing and um, everything that we offer on our website. Yeah, we care. So thank you yeah. for attending. Uh, we're honored that you um, are thinking through this different B and uh, do us two things. Uh, try it out and then um, tell your friends and family what you learned. This is um, the more people that understand there are bees that can create more food out there. The um, I think the better off we as a society will be. We'll get more food. So pass the word along. Thanks for sharing, guys. Thanks for coming along. Thanks for joining us, everybody.